welcome to the Catholic Nerds Podcast, your his and her and actual pronoun source for quality Catholic nerdery. This is Scott, Mary, Cody, and our special guests, Dr. Aaron Brewer and Maria Keffler. Thank you uh, for coming on the show. Uh, Dr. Aaron Brewer and Maria Keffler are the co-founders of Advocates Protecting Children and will be honored as the activists of the year at the upcoming Ruth Institute Summit here in Louisiana. Aaron is, an, is the author of a children's book, Always Aaron, as well as Transing Our Children. Maria is the author of Desist, to Trans, and Detox, Getting Your Child Out of the Gender Cult. And together, you two have created the devotional Gentle Leadings, as well as the video series and book, Common Sense Care for Parents and Teacher Talks for Educators. Welcome to the Catholic Nerds Podcast. Thank well, you. Thanks so for much. having us. <laughs> I do want to clarify the Gentle Thank Leadings you. book, um, the devotional, um, is written under a pseudonym by a parent who's been through this. And so we published it for that parent under a pseudonym. So. What's the awesome. pseudonym? To, uh, uh, Lanya, Lanya Kachani. Okay. And we'll include links to all this, uh, all the Amazon links um, in our show notes. So to make sure that y'all can uh, follow up on all these great titles. So um, can y'all tell us uh, your backgrounds? I know the, I know your, your, I've heard your stories. I know there's not all, it's not all easy parts to the stories, but as much as you'd like to share with us. You want to start, Maria? Okay, sure. Um, I was a teacher, and I got involved with this issue a few years ago when a friend of mine here in my school district called me and said, Maria, I was looking around the public school website for some summer school information. And I came across this transgender students policy meeting that's tonight. Yeah. She said, I really feel like we need to go and find out what this is about. So I went with her and we were horrified. The takeaway from the evening was that the school considers parents a threat. They wanna introduce all of these really outrageous policies um, like boys and girls getting to use each other ba other's bathrooms and sleeping in each other's hotel rooms, um, you know, basing everything on self-identity as we've come to learn more about. Um, and they want to keep it from parents. They consider parents a threat to their kids. And that was really a shock to me. And so a group of us parents started the Arlington Parent Coalition trying to push back on this in our district. Um, we had a few successes that a few of the really egregious things were kept out of the policy, um, but the school board made it very clear that they intended to work them right back in as soon as they could figure out a verbal workaround for them. Mm. So that's how I got introduced to this. And um, I met Aaron through our mutual work on this issue. And I'm so grateful and thankful uh, to be working with Maria. I just feel honored. She's brilliant and compassionate and strong. And I just feel like she um, is such an important voice in this with her. She also has a background in, I believe it's educational psychology to inform what she does. So and um, I'm sure in the, the, you find yourself surrounded by enemies a lot. So it's probably awesome to have people, somebody have your back the way y'all do. Yeah, yeah, we we commiserate a lot about how the rest of the world has gone crazy <laughs> and <Yeah>. how grateful <laughs> we are to have each other. Erin has such a, a powerful story, which I'm sure she's going to share, and so much insight. And even though I do have a background in educational psychology, was which was what initially made me start saying, "This is crazy. This is absolute <laughs> lunacy." But getting to know Erin and hearing her perspective on it, I've learned so much. And so I'm really grateful for our dynamic duo. <laughs> awesome. Should I go ahead and, and sure, tell yeah. how I, yeah. <laughs> so this is definitely something that I never thought I would get involved in. Um, but uh, it started out when I started hearing about puberty blockers and um, the fact that puberty blockers sterilize children. And it just horrified me because when I was a little girl, I had a transgender identity and I just kept thinking what would have happened to me 
if instead of having, you know, the kind and compassionate teachers that I had back then who helped me to understand that I wasn't a boy, if I had had teachers that instead affirmed me and pushed me into identifying as a boy and put me on that pathway towards medicalization, I never would have um, the beautiful children that I have now that um, have just done wonders for helping me um, really embrace myself as a woman. And so I started out um, sort of, uh, I guess my first foray into this was going to a protest um, where, you know, it was a, it was a, it wasn't, I, I was my own little protest. It was a, a rally, you know, a pro-trans rally. And I went there by myself with a sign that said, stop um, trans eugenics, um, which probably wasn't the smartest thing. I didn't really have a concept of this movement yet. I just thought this is just a small group of um, fringe people, uh, about but it what, sort of. Well, about what year is this? Oh goodness, uh, probably 2017 or 18. So, um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, I got an e or a, a letter from Equality Utah. I used to be a strong supporter of Equality Utah. And so I was on their mailing list and I got a letter talking about the conversion therapy ban they were proposing. And as I read through it, I realized that they were trying to ban the very therapy that helped me when I was a child to, um, to manage first to manage and then to resolve my gender dysphoria and ultimately grow up and be comfortable being a woman rather than insisting that I was a man. And so I started speaking out um, publicly about my experience being a transgender child. And that, that is how I, I, I connected with Maria. Um, I was invited to speak at an Eagle Forum event at, where she was also speaking in Washington. And we'd known each other online, but we met in person and just, um, it, was, it was like, uh, we just were sisters um, mm -hmm. in this movement. And so since then, we've just been doing everything we can to fight back. Um, we started something called the Compassion Coalition which is an international online um, group that uh, is more about information dissemination to people who are, who are coming into this confused, trying to figure out what's going on, trying to just share resources. Um, and then we formed um, Advocates Protecting Children specifically to do more uh, work to educate and do outreach. Um, I also do a fair amount of testifying at legislative hearings um, related to uh, the therapy bans, but also to um, try to advocate for stopping these medical interventions. Because again, if I had been put on the path of medical transitioning, I would be sitting before you with my body very damaged, and I wouldn't have the beautiful children that I have today. And advocates protecting children. What's what's the? Uh, can you give us the website for that? That's advocatesprotectingchildren.org. Awesome. Yeah, I we just interviewed um, Dr. Jennifer Roback Morris, uh, Morris, uh, just recently, and that will be uh, going out on into the world pretty soon as well. Um, Mary, Cody, and I, we've all been involved in the pro life movement, but I'm just now starting to wrap my mind around uh, gender clinics, you know, gender reassignment clinics. We've done lots of work in front of abortion clinics. But this is a whole new world. It's yeah. interesting that you say that because Planned Parenthood is one of the biggest um, providers of cross-sex hormones at this point. Really? And so, um, yeah, it, it, in fact, I've done a number of interviews with um, detransitioners. So, so primarily young women who, who thought they were trans went to Planned Parenthood, got a prescription for testosterone within an hour. Um, without any kind of evaluation, without any recommendation, nothing. Right. It's oh called God. the informed consent model. So all they have to do is sign something saying they understand that there are some risks and they walk out with a prescription for testosterone. Of course, that informed consent isn't accurate because we don't know all the risks um, right. that come from doing this. But, but Planned Parenthood has this business model and they are raking in the big bucks with this because so many children are taking on this trans identity. So many young people are. Right. And, and uh, Abigail Schreier, who wrote a book called Irreversible Damage, uh, wrote a, another article. She had somebody from Planned Parenthood contact her and say, we don't do any kind of screening. We are just, you know, 
if, a, if somebody comes in and wants the, the cross sex hormones, we give them to them and they're coming in in groups, giggling as if it's like a social activity. So these are not kids who are struggling with gender dysphoria. This is a social contagion. It's now the cool thing to do. Um, unfortunately, right. as we know, teenagers don't have that long-term um, processing. They don't understand the long-term mm -hmm. consequences. So a lot of these kids, you know, a couple years down the line, they realize they've they've damaged themselves permanently. Um, and there's not a lot of recourse right now. We just talked to a detransitioner yesterday, a young woman who talked about being in the GSA club at her school, the Gender Sexuality Alliance. Mm -hmm. And she was in a school that was um, sixth through 12th grade. And they had all of these kids, sixth through 12th graders meeting in the GSA club with no adult in the room. And they'd talk about how great it was going to be when they could get on cross-sex hormones as soon as they could ditch their parents. And she said, none of them had any idea what testosterone does to a girl's body or what estrogen right. does to a boy's body. It was just this, isn't this cool? We're all so awesome. This is going to be so much fun. And not even an adult in the room right. mediating that conversation. And would you, would you all tell us about um, I've heard you talk about at other places how testosterone from when a girl takes it is kind of a, a rush. There is kind of a, would y'all talk, uh, give us more insight into that? Well, I think that's something that most people don't understand. Um, you know, these kids who get on, especially the girls get on testosterone, they feel really good. So they're going around telling their friends and their, you know, their parents are, are excited because they all of a sudden feel really good. Their teachers are excited. So everybody thinks, well, this must have been the cure. They must have needed this. But any yeah, but single... it's, and it's because the testosterone is a mood booster. It boosts right. your mood, it boosts your confidence. Right. It also um, in, improves your... Um, um, muscle, you know, it, it, girls who are struggling maybe with weight issues, it tends to help with redistribution of fat. Um, so pretty much any female who takes testosterone, well, any male too, actually, yeah. who starts taking testosterone is initially going to feel really good. Uh, one of the things that people don't know about is that there was recently a class action lawsuit by men who were taking testosterone to boost their you know, mask feelings of masculinity to, to feel more virile. And, and it turns out even when men take extra testosterone, it's very dangerous. So just imagine what this mm. is doing to the women's bodies. Another thing people don't understand is that children as young as eight years old, girls as young as eight years old are, are being prescribed testosterone. So these are girls who are prepubescent, who haven't gone through puberty, who are oftentimes also on puberty blockers, which, um, you know, induce a developmental delay, put on mm -hmm. cross-sex hormones, um, their, in, their, their fertility is compromised as well as their um, uh, sexual function. So, th so this is just profound damage being done to children. Which of course we, oh, sorry. We, we don't let eight-year-olds make life-changing decisions in other areas. Like we don't let them enlist in the military, like, like pre, like, what would you they call They can't it? rent a car. Right. They, they can't rent a can't car. Get a loan. They can't, they can't commit to lifelong things. Even if they would come later, they can't commit to those lifelong things as an eight-year-old. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was just thinking an eight-year-old, I mean, just a year earlier was thinking she was a dinosaur. Yeah. yeah. You know, like it's very young. It's That's, well, and when you were talking about the conversion therapy bans, I was just thinking how sort of ironic it is that that it's called conversion therapy when in reality it's a therapy to help stay as you are <laughs> to to remain in your in your natural state and that that's what we're banning versus something that completely physically alters a person oh they have just okay. captured the language on this right. this yeah. trans ideology right. is just backwards world because yeah. um yeah. we just had somebody email us today calling us hateful awful bigoted and and she said, if you have any trans kids, send them to me because I will love them the way they are. Like, no, <laughs> right. the way right. they are if is- They're reassigning their gender. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I think that's what's so frustrating is that this ideology is convincing kids that they can't survive 
unless they kill who they are right, and become right. somebody else. And to me, that's just, that's, I mean, there's no justification for that ever. And mm -hmm. they're encouraging right, these right. kids to believe that they're incapable of handling any kind of difficult feelings that they have. And children should, right. the, the opposite message should be given to children, that they're strong, right. that they can overcome difficult feelings, that who they are is, you know, that they, that they don't need to change. They don't right. need to um, alter their body, their physical appearance in order to be acceptable. And you, you had mentioned the social contagion part of this or like the dark evangelization, like how when they do want to transition, what different outreach methods that are undertaken by the other guys, like the love bombs, things like that. Well, not to mention uh, that there are gender clinics that send uh, specialists into schools to put on programs, letting kids know that they might be born in the wrong body. Um, we have kids right. as young as kindergarten who are being read the book, I Am Jazz, and given given the misbelief that it's possible to be born in the wrong body. Like planting these seeds of doubt mm -hmm. where there might not have really, either, either there might've been a very passing thought or none. But, it, but we're going ahead and-, and Or a and, thought of, if I have any problem at all, aha, it's because I'm- It's because of this. Right. 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 Because I- all have problems. <laughs> right. I, like, I feel like we've witnessed that being an issue where like maybe there were issues initiating like relationships, like romantic relationships. And so it's like, oh, well, maybe, maybe I'm not a girl or maybe I'm not a boy, you know? And that's what the problem is versus just that relationships are hard and- that people are immature and you just haven't found the right person yet. And so if this has already been introduced over and over again as a, a, a very common potential problem, of course, they're going to, you know, lean into that mm -hmm. and run with that. Well, and so many of these kids that are getting drawn into this are on the autism spectrum or mm -hmm. have some sort of, you know, neuro, neurotypic, neuro, neuroatypicality that they're not like other kids. And, and that is just feeding into this because these kids who are on the autism spectrum, they already have social issues. You know, they don't right. relate to others the way most people do. They don't do. fit in. They right. don't. And, and we're so sexualized as a society right now. I, at my daughter's um, 10th birthday party, she had four or five little friends over and I was serving spaghetti and they all broke into, I don't remember what song it was now, but it was one of the popular songs on the radio. And I was just horrified. I'm like, you can't sing lyrics like that at my <laughs> dining table. But like, they right. all knew this. And so these right. kids are getting the message. If I'm not feeling sexual, then something's wrong with me. Right. Well, you're not supposed to feel sexual at your age. That doesn't start till post-puberty. But now the message they're getting is if you don't feel sexual, that means you're asexual. That means you're transgender. Right. That means something's wrong with mm -hmm. you. Right. And, and also and we say, say oh, go ahead. I was just going to say with, with people on the spectrum, we say like, oh, they don't fit in. But in reality, it's like nobody really fits in, but it's, it's harder for someone on the spectrum to sort of figure out how to kind of emulate what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. And like, in reality, all young people are trying so hard to fit in <laughs> and all young people are struggling with feelings of, of, oh, maybe I don't belong here, or maybe I'm not, you know, someone people are going to want to be around and all those different feelings. And so for a person on the spectrum, who's having trouble, maybe kind of rolling with that as well as other people, you know, then they turn to this instead, mm -hmm. instead of us realizing like, well, no, everyone's going through this. Everyone's feeling like they don't fit in. Everyone's struggling, you know? I think they, the, that those on the, uh, the other side, basically, and not just with this issue, but with uh, the, the issue of abortion and all the other issues, they've done a really good job of capturing the language, mm -hmm. um, especially right. when it, like you just said, uh, something's wrong with them. Well, they would say, well, no, nothing's wrong with them. They're, they're just not being who they are. Right. Whereas we know logically being who they are is like that doesn't make sense because they are who they are. Right. Um, and, and it just but they've done a really good job of capturing the language in so many of these topics and really flooding the culture with that language that uh, whenever we finally get around to it, like we're already decades behind. Mm -hmm. This has really been, I think, a psychological operations campaign. And I know I sound a little bit like a conspiracy theorist when I say that, but when you look at how PSYOPs projects work, 
it's capturing the language. It's coming up with those slogans. It's it's everything that's been done here. And you're right. When I first got involved with this and I started investigating it, I thought we are so far behind the curve. We just right. did not expect this. Because it seemed like through the looking glass at mm -hmm. one time, like it was like, oh, this is so- So far-fetched. So far-fetched yeah. and so fringe. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and then suddenly not. <laughs> Well, yeah. and, and it's interesting because I will be talking to people and they'll just say, that's not happening. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, yeah, it is actually. Um, right. Some of the stuff that we find is so outrageous that we don't even um, share it on social media because we know it, it sounds crazy. Yeah. Like, really? There's no way that could really be happening. But one of the ways that they've been so effective at getting this through is by convincing kids that anybody who doesn't believe in this ideology isn't safe. And they use this kind of language very, very um, like they're protecting kids. These anybody who doesn't affirm you isn't safe. They're they're trying to erase you. They're um, they're dangerous. They're hateful. They're bigots. Nazis, and, fascists, right? Well, well, while at the same violent. time, le legitimizing this intergenerational intimacy, right? Exactly. So it's it's in, they're they're grooming kids while at the same time um, alienating these children from anybody who who would be their protectors, which is right. very cult like. That's exactly right. what yeah. cults mm -hmm. do. Right. Yeah. There's this just there's these two. This is might seem somewhat random, but there's these two Disney movies that one of them we still love even though we felt like there was this kind of subtle message in it and the other one we were just like no we're never watching that ever again but moana there I don't, have you guys ever seen mm -hmm. moana or I, i've there's, seen moana there's there's this thread running through it of you have to be true to who you are and mm -hmm. listen to the voice inside of you and that the calling she had this calling to go out and save the world and that at some point she says like the call isn't out there it's inside me and i have to listen to it mm -hmm. and to an extent, like that's not that dangerous of a message, but after we watched it, we were like, the, the thing that will save the world, that she will be destroying the world if she does not listen to the voice inside of her. And mm -hmm. there's no standard by which to judge that voice. She's also kind of run away from all of her mentors. She's run away from her parents. Mm -hmm. um, well, and, and based we just, on my experience, our, our voices, those voices can be wrong. Exactly. That voice telling me that exactly. I was a boy, it was completely wrong. Precisely. It was a coping mechanism. Right, right. But the message of the movie, which again, we still kind of love Moana because it was- There's other messages. There's other good messages in it. Yeah. Right. But there was this, there was this kind one. of subtle message of like, if you don't listen to any voice that you have inside you, you're betraying creation. <laughs> you, yeah. The whole, literally the world could end if you do this. And then there's this other movie, Raya and the Last Dragon, that's more mm. recent. And the entire mm. message of this movie was that she had to trust the main character had this female character that kept trying to kill her. And she was told the world would end if she did not keep putting herself in dangerous situations with that person mm. over and over and over again. And we were like, well, that's not that subtle. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's pretty straightforward. So just as far as that it's it's cult-like and it's this pervasive messaging, mm -hmm. when we finished that movie, we were like, that was just grooming. That was that was a movie yeah. entirely about. Yeah. About oh, you've seen this in, in all kinds of, I mean, it's in the in the, it's in the music, it's in the movies, right. it's on TV. Every TV program now has got trans characters in it. Um, but even we just watched um, Red the the story oh. about the little girl who turns into a red panda and i i prefaced it before my children watched it i'm like you know there's just a couple of things i want you to be aware of but one of them was toward the end she's decided she's going to keep her panda and her mother tries to correct her and she goes my panda my choice right. oh. i'm like oh <laughs> we know what that sounds like right. doesn't it doesn't right. it you know um, that's the thing I keep trying to tell my kids is every book, every movie, every song, everything you encounter is created by somebody who has a worldview mm -hmm. and they are trying to convince you of their worldview. And you need to be asking, what is this song trying to tell me? And is it right? Is it true? Right. And I think that's something that we as a culture just don't really do enough. Right. And also, I think we sometimes try to think that like, oh, this is by accident that these mm -hmm. things are in these movies and these books and these songs. No, and more, it's not. <laughs> so much thought and effort goes into every single word of these things. Nothing is yeah. by accident. In right. 
in these speaking of speaking of all these words i was watching uh aaron's uh youtube channel and you had included it was from tti was it the transition training institute uh this the introduction to one of these always maybe (laughs) yeah her the this trans individual his name is maybe, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and he contains multitudes. Yeah, oh, I know. I was like, he might as well have said, I am legion, you know, exercise <laughs> me. But yeah, if you, if you want I mean, to talk it's, about it's, that. I laugh about it, but at the same time, it's heartbreaking because right. these, these are people who have been convinced that they're inherently flawed. And one of the trends that I'm seeing is that kids who are adopting a transgender identity, it's a dissociative disorder. And they're starting to develop more and more identities. So they'll develop the one identity and then maybe that didn't work out. So they'll have another identity. I've seen some people saying that they should be allowed to have multiple birth certificates to represent each of their identities. Um, and this is this is indicative of the fact that this is you know, a mental health issue. Right. You don't address the underlying issues, um, they get worse. And that's what I'm seeing. And when I see that, that that poor man named maybe who contains yeah. multitudes um you know when you look at the description he gives of himself it's it's he does not have a you know he's most my my um you know impression is that this is someone who's very similar to someone with a personality disorder which is a profound right. mental health issue and instead of getting help that he needs he's he's told how brave and authentic he is and we hear that all the time we hear that from from detransitioners all the time that once they announce a trans identity nothing else ever gets discussed Um, even kids who already had an autism or depression or something else diagnosed once they say i'm trans nobody will discuss any of those other issues anymore, which is wrong and heartbreaking. Well, and, and just that video, I was thinking about a future world of, well, a present world where nothing gets discussed because the whole meeting is just, we have to identify our pronouns before we say anything. It's right. the whole meetings. To, that's maybe uh, he, he called himself a Demi woman. I think Demi Gorgon, like uh from stranger things but <laughs> in this future world where we don't communicate anymore we just identify ourselves the whole time right. and someone well, i know they got an email from a student saying well these are the pronouns i'd like you to use when speaking to me like in front of the class and these are the pronouns i'd like you to use wow. in private communications with me and and she was like i cannot <laughs> Like, how could I possibly accommodate this if, like, especially if every if it single was, one of my students asked yeah. me to do this? Oh, wow. Well, that's that interesting that I you say that because one of the things that I've heard for, um, is uh, a lot of times, um, especially uh, men who identify as transgender will complain about going to the doctor and being misgendered. Um, but then they'll also complain if they go to the doctor and they're not asked if they um, need a pap smear. And they'll, you know, they'll also complain <sighs> if they are asked if they need a pap smear. I mean, it's just right. constant There's no winning. confusion. And can you imagine being a doctor or a teacher and having to keep track of all of these um, pronouns yeah, and, right. and, you know, special names for parts because we're not allowed to call our anatomy what it is anymore we have to call right. it you know we're, we're chest feeding now instead of breastfeeding um all of this um you know appropriation of language in order to further the agenda and it means that teachers can't teach and doctors have to be incredibly careful about doctoring i mean it just is it's you, insane you talked about a um an incident where a man was trying to a father was trying to prevent his child from being medicalized and how did the judge begin the courtroom session? <laughs> My pronouns are he, him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that right there is tipping the hat that, that this is not going to be a fair trial. It's not a good day in court for you, buddy. No. Yeah, I think. It's also, uh, it's also like just as far as how the culture has or how so much of the language has been taken and transformed and that we're often told that we're not empathetic or not or that we're like selfish or, or narrow-minded, but how kind of narcissistic it is to think that every situation you go into, that you're gonna, you know, that everyone has to adjust to your own personal specific thing instead of there being something more mm-hmm. broad and more- But consistent. narcissism is only a problem for uh, men nowadays. 
<laughs> Especially ones that look like me and Cody. I wasn't going to say. <laughs> Can you change your I am. Well, and that's, that's another thing is I can't think of any other mental health issue or any other medical condition because it's either one or the other. If it's a mental health issue, they need therapy. If it's a med, you know, if it's not a medical issue, they wouldn't need all these medical interventions. Right. But there's no other kind of inter, you know, uh, condition I can think of that requires society as part of a treatment plan that requires society to do certain things as part of our treatment plan. And, and it's, it, even, even you, you mentioned the word cis. Um, I just bristle at the, at that, at that term cisgender for those who don't know what it is. It's someone who completely and hundred percent identifies with the sex that they were born. And I don't have a clue what that means. Um, <laughs> I don't know anybody. I don't know GI Joe and I don't know Barbie. I don't right, think right. they actually exist. Thank goodness. Right. <laughs> Which that's the added tragedy of this whole thing is we spent decades telling girls that you didn't have to adhere to these very overly <laughs> feminine norms and boys that you don't have to adhere to these overly masculine norms. But now, you know, all bets are off. <laughs> yeah, if you don't conform completely to those gender right. stereotypes, then you're transgender. The other issue for me with the word cis is that it's replacing, it's very intentionally replacing woman. Mm -hmm. I am not a cis woman, I am just a woman. Right. Erin is not a cis woman, she is a woman. Can and you, it's trying can you, can to say, we define it? yeah, it's trying to redefine <laughs> what we are and to define it around trans, to make trans be the central figure. And if you're not trans- So it's normative. Cis. Yeah. yeah, right. That that reminds me, we recently did an interview with someone who considers herself a trans widow. This is a woman who was married to a man who decided after they had had two children that he was actually a woman. And um, one of the things about the trans ideology is that women are not allowed to call ourselves mothers anymore. We're birthing people. But men who decide that they're women are allowed to call themselves mothers. <laughs> well, and also <laughs> how like, he took, the, he took that term, like he installed himself as the mother of their children and booted her out as the mother. So the, the cis widow was which one? The wife uh, was the, the, the oh, actual. Call, they call her the trans widow. Trans widow. Um, okay. And this because, is because right. she's a widow to the trans. Because partner. he essentially oh, okay. killed himself. And became a different person. He killed his identity uh, and he took on a new identity. Yeah. identity. Well, and also there was something that y'all, oh, just the fact that like, oh, so now we're going to call female mothers birthing people <laughs> when we fought so hard to, to basically get out of the paradigm of like that women are just, you know, people we're who give birth. Right? <laughs> we're baby factories. Yeah. Yeah. This is so fun. <laughs> like in the sense that like, it's not at all. Well, and, and just, I mean, in, in a way, it's just brilliant, the language manipulation. I mean, the more, I mean, it's like every day I'm like, wow. I mean, if somebody couldn't have planned this better to just completely confuse people, you know, on, on one of the things that we just get so frustrated about is news reporting on these issues. So you'll see a news story that says, you know, um, hateful transphobes are trying to prevent poor transgender children from using the bathroom. Well, that's not at all what's happening. Or right. hateful transphobes are trying to pre prevent trans people from participating in sports. That's not what's happening. Well, we see um, that right now. We see that right now. They're saying that um, trans people are being prevented from, from playing sports. No, they're not. No, they're being required to play sports that, that corresponds with their biology, with their, mm -hmm. you know, what sex they are. Um, and oh. I had a thought and it just flew out of my head. What about, uh, I have an interesting one, a friend of mine, and I think Scott knows, um, her, him as well. Um, uh, she, she has, she's trans. So, but she identifies as a man, but she yeah. argues against, um, trans in sports. Like trans participating in the sport that they identify not participating with. in sports but participating, participating in the in the, uh, in in the, the one they identify with so i thought that was okay. very interesting that that she's able to acknowledge like no there's definitely a difference in the build even if you're on testosterone or estrogen it's completely different in the biological build yeah, so men, I, I just, men can't become women 
-hmm. and women can't become men and we shouldn't be suggesting to children that they can. So when, when a news story says um, transphobes are trying to stop children from using the bathroom, what's actually happening is is reasonable people are trying to make sure that girls use the girls bathroom and boys use the boys bathroom because when that doesn't happen bad things result right. and we've seen that in Loudoun County where um, two girls were raped by a boy who was going into the girls bathrooms um, this is why we have sex segregated spaces right. or um, you had talked uh, previously about James Tubbs or you know I, I didn't Anna, think of his AKA, name yeah yeah. And this is a this is a man who sexually assaulted a 10 year old who then took on a trans identity and was housed with girls instead of in a men's in men's prison. Any other you know, situation like this, it would be a man going to a man's prison. But instead, he was housed actually, I believe, a juvenile detention center with girls. Um, and he was like 24 at the time. If yeah, I and he was 24, but because the crime happened when he was a juvenile, they put him in. Um, subsequently, he was um, found guilty of murder and has since been moved to an adult prison. I'm not sure if he's still housed with males or females, but um, increasingly right. men are able to simply say, I'm actually a woman without making any kind of changes to their external appearance, including their genitalia and being moved to, to women's prisons where women are you know, being raped and impregnated um, because they are men. And, and so this is just a, I mean, in so many ways, it's, it's a danger to our society as a whole, but specifically to women and children. And, and this what? disorder and fog, uh, yeah. it's only going to benefit the predators. Mm -hmm. We even find that we have, I mean, we're in the thick of this and we'll be discussing a news story or something and we'll find ourselves going, wait, wait, is that, is that a man who identifies as a woman? Are we talking about a real woman right. or wait, is this a woman who identifies as a man? I mean, if we're confused about this and we're in the weeds on this every day, what is this doing to society? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I recently saw a story that reported that, um, women are committing more sex crimes than ever before. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's changing even our um, epidemiological right. data. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's incredibly damaging. And I just can't right. even imagine what it's like for children growing up in this society. As Maria said, we oftentimes are like, oh, wait a minute. Like you just did, boy, male, hey, she, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> if we're struggling, imagine what it's like for kids. Right. <laughs> whose cognitive ability might otherwise might also be diminished by cell phones, video games, all the mm -hmm. other distractions. Right. Oh, we just tell people, don't let your child have a smartphone. Yeah. No smartphone. Don't let your child on social media. And I have to be uh, hesitant about saying this because I know it's not possible for everyone, but I'm really like, if there is any possible way, way to get your children out of the public schools, do so. I pulled all of mine four years ago now. Um, and I, I trained as a public school teacher. I always was a proponent of you go to the public schools, you go to school with the people that you neighbor with, you don't self-segregate. Self and when I saw what was happening, when I see what's going on now, I'm like, get out. There is, it's toxic. Mm -hmm. So cell phones, social media, and public school, if you yeah. can get those away from your kids, you'll be ahead of the game. Let's yes. talk about parent advice for a minute from, from the, from y'all's or from Maria's book, desist, the trans and detox, getting your child out of the gender cult. Um, one of the lines from the blurb is caught in the maelstrom of gender identity, politics, medical experimentation, and a cultural zeitgeist that paints the family as the, as the oppressor. Parents are lied to from every quarter and told they must consent to their children's gender transition medicalization, but there is a different and saner path. So if any other parental advice y'all could offer, they'd be very helpful. Erin? Well, I'm actually working on a book, um, Parenting in a Transgender World. Perfect. Um, specifically, <laughs> sort of to give parents, first of all, to give them the vocabulary and the foundation of what's going on in a very simple and accessible way. And then to explain the tactics that the transgender ideology is using to recruit their children. And then um, some things that they can do, because there are things parents can do to help protect their children from this ideology. One of them is um, grounding in reality. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and building a family history. And one of the things that I really advocate is for parents from a very young age to start creating family stories that you tell of each other, mm -hmm. um, have pictures of the family out and about, have, um, have rituals and traditions that you do. Because one of the ways that the transgender ideology gets to kids is by separating them from their families. And if kids have a very strong family identity, then it's much harder for that identity to be broken away and for them to take on a trans identity. As Catholic parents, we can we tend to take that even a step further by having the family, the communion of saints, mm. you know, adorning our houses, not just with um, our biological, our family tree, but our um, our community, our saints, you know, mm. our kids named after saints. And mm. well, that's one of the things that trans really does is it doesn't just separate children from their families. It separates them from themselves. You're not even the same person anymore. It separates them from their history. That's an entirely different person who's dead now. It separates them from all their relationships. You're no longer a, a, a niece or a nephew, or you don't have aunts and uncles. It separates them from their um, their family history. You know, my family came primarily over from Germany, but I don't have to identify with that anymore because now I'm this entirely new person. It cuts them off from everything. And I really like what Aaron said about grounding them in reality. A story I like to tell a friend of mine grew up in communist Croatia. A few years ago, we were talking about what was happening in the schools. And she said, I see here happening the same thing that happened in communist countries, what's going on in the schools. And I asked her, how did your parents help you keep your Christian faith strong when you didn't have a choice. They didn't have homeschool. They didn't have private schools. Everybody's going to the government school. And she said, oh, they just told us. They told us before we ever went to school, you're going to go to school and the teachers are going to tell you there's no such thing as God. That's a lie. You're going to go to school. They're going to tell you that the Bible is fiction. That's a lie. And when I think about that and I sort of apply psychological principles to it, that's the primacy effect. We believe the first thing we are taught and we believe it with a lot of um, determination. It's very hard to change someone's mind. And that's why this trans ideology is trying to get kids younger and younger and younger because they wanna be the first one to tell the kids what gender is, what sex is about. Good parents, we don't tend to tell our kids about sex and stuff until they get older because they don't need to know that. But now we need to know that the schools and the influencers and social media, they're trying to, to take advantage of that primacy effect by telling our kids what they want the kids to believe before we ever tell them anything. So that's really the heart of our curriculum. We did a, a kindergarten through fifth grades um, faith-based curriculum that just teaches kids three things, that God made people to be male, female, boy, girl, man, woman, that's it. There's nothing else that some people don't know that. And some people are going to tell you that's not true, but they're wrong. They're mistaken. And that God made you a boy or a girl exactly the way you are. And we feel like those are the three messages that we need to be hitting home with children really early, really before anybody else gets their messages in. I think I sometimes put off, like we, our oldest is seven. Um, and she, she's in a fairly, like, she's not getting exposed to too much, but every now and then there'll be a TV show or something or a movie where something comes up. And I think sometimes I, or I say sometimes of late, I've figured we need to start having this conversation, but I'm scared of saying the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like with what you guys just said, it's like, the most important thing is to go ahead and start talking about it in a, in a compassionate and calm and an authoritative sort of <laughs> like right. not authoritative, like, like no, disciplinary but, style, but they'll but, listen you know. to you because right. one of the things that they're doing in schools, um, not just with the gender ideology, but with um, comprehensive sexuality in general is called um, values clarification. And they're doing this to children. It's not clarification. Basically what they're saying is these are the values you must have. And if you have a child who's never um, heard a counterpoint to those values, right then it's very easy for them to pull the child in. But if the child has been you know, 
knows firmly what his or her values are and is um, challenged with it, then they're less likely to get sucked into it. So I suggest that parents, you know, if you're watching a show and, you know, there's a transgender character, pause the video and talk to the child about it. And that's an opportunity for you to do your own family values clarification so that the child is um, grounded in that. So that when they're challenged outside of your home, um, they already, they have already thought about it and to explain the repercussions. So, you know, most children, um, they're, they're even going to understand if you say to your seven-year-old, what would happen if daddy decided he was a girl? Like she would probably laugh, but then if you start like, oh no, that would be horrible. I wouldn't have a daddy anymore. Um, you know, or what would happen if, if, uh, if your friend decided that he was a boy, oh, um, you know, kids are, kids can like kind of take these out to their limit and maybe even think of repercussions we wouldn't think of. But like you said, parents tend to be a little bit hesitant to talk about it. And I guess our, our um, sort of message is that you need to talk about it as, as uncomfortable as it is, right. because if you don't, then they're more vulnerable. Right. And I guess I should, I should clarify that I'm really excited to get y'all's books because I, <laughs> we definitely do need language. I guess I'm just, sometimes I hesitate in not going ahead and at least starting the conversation, you know, and I think it's important that we do go ahead and at least kind of well, it's address insane. the subject. I mean, it's understandable that you're uncomfortable yeah. because basically you have to introduce your child to this completely nonsensical and dangerous. Right. And the concept. stakes, the stakes are so high. Yeah. The stakes are so high. One of the things that I like to throw out is if there is something you really need to talk about, like you're watching that movie and, you know, something happens in the movie that you're like, I really need to clarify with my child that this is not okay. It's an easy way to start if you're not sure where to start. It's just like Aaron said, to pause it and say, wow, there's something here that's making me really uncomfortable. And I want to find out what you think about it. What do you think about that character? Yeah. Because I'm surprised how often my children, they're very astute Mm -hmm. and they'll see things that I I don't think that they would even pick up on. Right. And, and if, if you'll find out very quickly, if they're like, oh, they're trans and that's totally valid. Okay. This is a child who has been indoctrinated and I now need to address that. But just asking those open-ended questions can take the conversation in in places that you weren't expecting, but it can also feel a little less threatening. Right. And right. keep in mind that um, kindergartners and preschoolers are being exposed to this. They're right. specifically having teachers say, you need to go on a gender journey and figure out what sex you are. Um, as so, if there wasn't enough to deal I with. I know, as, as if there, well, and, and, and as if they couldn't be spending that valuable classroom time right. teaching yeah. important skills that kids, right. kids know. Uh, that's one of the other things that's just um, infuriating to me is that we have all these resources and time and energy going into this ideology and our kids are coming out without basic skills that they need to have, um, right. math and reading and writing. And right. how to apprehend reality itself. Yeah, and yeah, not to mention <laughs> yeah. thinking skills. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So great. tell us again the book that's coming out, the uh, the parenting book. What was the title? Oh, Common Sense Care. <laughs> okay. Um, and so yeah, it is parenting gender confused kids with love and truth. Um, it is a uh, kind of some edited transcripts from the um, videos that Maria and I did. And it addresses all different aspects of this, primarily for parents who have a child who's decided um, to announce a transgender identity. But it also, I think, is a good way for people who are unfamiliar with the ideology to get up to speed. I think almost everybody now knows somebody. I mean, we get calls and emails all the time. My cousin's daughter just announced this. And so I think it is a good book and a good series for people to just get familiar. When we first started Common Sense Care, the video series, we thought we'd do maybe seven or eight episodes. We're like, we want to address all the different topics around this for parents. And by the time we felt we'd exhausted it, we had 35 episodes. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Wow. And I, and I think we probably could have kept going, but we just felt like we need to move on to other issues. Um, yeah. Where can it, we but, watch that? The Common Sense Care videos are on YouTube, um, okay. our Advocates Protecting Children YouTube channel. We also have them as a podcast. So if you like to listen to podcasts as opposed to watch videos, it's on Podbean. 
thank you for making those free for us too mm-hmm. we probably i'm sure our subscribers would have uh would have paid but it's wonderful <laughs> to do it for us. you know we really feel we feel like it, parents need to know this stuff it's been so obfuscated and so hidden like we want parents to have the tools to parent their kids effectively i think maria and i both feel that we don't want to be making money off of this because it's just so horrific and so all the profits from our books go back into our efforts um we send packets of books out to legislators and policymakers and school board members and clergy because we we feel like we need to do outreach and education and uh, you know there have been a couple of times where we've we've talked about like well maybe for our next book we should we should keep the profits for ourselves because we put so much of our time and energy into this every time i just think i don't i don't want to profit off of this because it's just so ugly um i want it to be over as soon as possible and the more we can just keep um funding our efforts I'm hoping the sooner this will end, you know, word will get out, people will find out what's happening and start fighting back. So what is the best way that our listeners can find y'all online? And then secondly, help uh, support your, your um, advocacy initiatives, uh, support you guys. Well, our website is advocatesprotectingchildren.org. We have a donate button right on the website. Um, We do really appreciate any financial support we can get. We don't charge when we speak. Um, We really try to operate um, putting as much of our money as we can into the outreach, into getting the word out. Um, You can reach us at advocatesprotectingchildren at gmail.com. Again, we're on YouTube, we're on Podbean, we're on Twitter and Instagram and Getter. And I'd also encourage people to sign up for um, for alerts because um, like just recently uh, we've done a couple of alerts. State Farm um, came out and announced that they were they were donating all these um, transgender books oh, to schools yeah. and libraries. And so we you know we as quickly as possible um, started a campaign to uh, get people to to push back. And 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 when we find situations like this, we'll create a script, give give links, um, give people all the information they need so that they can very quickly quickly do something just uh, copy people, paste and send uh, a lot of people want to do something but they just don't know how um, when there's legislative actions we'll put out just a, a simple script with the emails and phone numbers of the legislators to call so if if people only have you know five minutes a week to dedicate to this um, we'll find you know we'll give you something that you can do with those five minutes but you don't have to spend um, time trying to figure it out and I think that that's been really useful and the question we like to ask uh, all our guests is what do you like to nerd out about <laughs> Aaron your ne- your nerdy stuff is so much cooler like, than mine what don't I nerd out about <laughs> I know when you ask that I'm like I'm trying to think of something about myself that isn't nerdy yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gotta be cool nerdy <laughs> No, it's, it's like the antithesis of nerd. She's like the, <laughs> the you know, the, the, the popular kid who, who gets it. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like the kid who read science fiction in high school. <laughs> well, her, her that's nerd thing was crocheting and knitting, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I, that's what I like to do for fun is knitting and crocheting. Yeah. And I recently took up spinning wool. So yeah. I am now spinning my own yarn and I've finally gotten it to where I'm like, I can call this yarn. This is good. So yeah. you need to get a, a herd of sheep while you're at it. I had that for a little while. It didn't work out so well, but you know, I went to the Maryland, uh, the Maryland wool and sheep festival in May with a friend of mine. And I was absolutely all nerdy geeked out about all this, but I took a picture of, um, they were auctioning off some sheep and I sent it to my husband and I'm like, hope you don't mind. I'm bidding. You can always just send them to me. I live in Northern Utah and we have half an acre oh, so they yeah. could, uh, you know, just mow the lawn Probably. for me. Yeah. <laughs> you can, you you can shear them and Ooh. send the fleece back to me. <laughs> we, need, we need some basic bartering systems. Exactly. <laughs> These are basic life skills. Yep. Spinning wool and 
Well, tell, I want to hear more about your physics, yeah, your, your physics. Nerdy oh, my, me and my nerding out on physics. Well, yeah. And I, I, this is interesting. Um, I, st I started out being interested in nuclear physics, um, because I was curious, you know, I, 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 I was brought up a hardcore liberal, you know, no nukes. I have, you know, I have a whole collection of no nukes pins and, <laughs> and I, you know, at some point I just was curious, like how do nukes even work? And so I started to um, learn about nuclear engineering, which got me interested in more theoretical physics, which got me interested in sort of very theoretical physics. And I came up with this whole theory of a wavetron, which I've been told is just absurd, but um, I like to think about it. it. It's fun for me when I'm, you know, doing doing sort of mundane things to kind of fly off into the um, sort of theoretical physics world. <laughs> That's awesome. You should, so you could take up crocheting and be crocheting while you think about the wave of right. like Well, and the other thing, I'm sorry. See, now I'm, now I'm geeking out. You got me excited. Right. Yeah. Right. When I first right. heard about entangled particles, I was like, oh, this yeah. is beyond cool. Yeah. Um, you know? It is very cool. <laughs> well, I just, I mean, I tell. I tell people that I'm working on a formula to predict prime numbers to infinity, but I just say that for kicks and grins. I'm not actually <laughs> doing that, but you're yeah. like actually doing this. Kind you're, of you're not. I know it's a little bit scary. <laughs> we don't have to worry about making up absurd particles because I mean, we have yeah, the at this point, I mean, I could even identify as a wave -tron and define my <laughs> properties and people would have to uh, authenticate and validate me and affirm <laughs> my uh... <laughs> work on your pronouns for that. What are your pronouns? <laughs> wave and Tron. Yeah. Well, it'd be like your quarks, right? You could be strange. Exactly. Up, up, down, left, right. <laughs> quark, quark. Yeah, you could be the seventh quark. When I was when I was first into this, I saw this cartoon, and I think it might have been David Feynman who came up with it. But it was a picture of a duck, and it said, "Beware of the quantum duck." And then, like, it had a a speech bubble that said, "Quark, quark." Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it has been awesome nerding out with y'all. Um, we hope to have you back sometime and bring back some more nerdy goodness. <laughs> oh, and we'll probably, uh, a couple of us will see you this coming weekend at the Ruth Institute Summit, which uh, we will provide links to in the show notes. So you can still, it's too late to buy an in-person ticket, but you can still buy a virtual ticket. Uh, make sure you have all the information you need for that. Thank you for nerding out with us, the Catholic nerds. This has been Scott Smith. Mary Reed, Cody Reed, and our special guests, Dr. Aaron Brewer and Maria Keffler. Please do subscribe to this podcast and share it with all your friends, Catholic or not. And don't forget to spay and neuter your dogs and cats, folks, but not your kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, uh, Dr. Morris gave us a seal of approval on that, so I felt like I could reuse it. <laughs> Scott always shocks us with the intros, or at least shocks me. Maybe, maybe <laughs> the Cody's. outros. I had no. I just yeah. tell you though, this is very interesting. There is a, a a local trans activist who I've had a couple of tense run-ins with, and yeah. she she now is posting that it's unethical to spay and neuter <sighs> animals, and yet. <laughs> oh my God. That's you insane. Can your, you can cut your daughter's breasts off and cut your son's oh. testicles oh off, and that's gosh. all good. Yeah. Oh. That doesn't oh make gosh. any sense. Yeah. You know, every time we think, I'm like, it can't get any, any worse. It can't <laughs> right. get any weirder. Somebody's like, hold my beer. Right. And, yeah. And just, <laughs> yeah.